First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference, Trends in Magnetism 2021, for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to present our results. The title is Magnonic Qubit Computing, and I will show you how we can use Magnonic recipes to realize a qubit calculus. I have to give a disclaimer already here at this point, because there are two types of qubit computing a classic version and a quantum mechanical version. We will stay here in the classic domain, but you will see that still we can do a lot of uh, qubit computing and it has a lot of advantages over conventional uh, CMOS type calculus. You see a long list of authors and co-authors. Um, in particular, I would like to point out Morteza Moseni, who has done as part of his PhD all the numerical simulations. I'm going to show you, I would like to pick out here Michael Schneider, who has done as part of his PhD the ultra-fast rapid cooling mechanism. I am reporting under the supervision of Philip Perrault and Andre Chumak. Andre is now a professor at Vienna University. Collaboration with Arne Bratasch at Trondheim University is very much acknowledged. And I also would particularly acknowledge the collaboration with Victor Wolf, who has provided a lot of theoretical input. So let's get started. What I will discuss is computing with macroscopic wave functions. So we have wave functions, like you have the wave functions for the visible light. So we have interference in the system. And uh, if we would like to do this kind of computing, of course, we have to find a suitable system. And the system choice, you might guess, is a magnonic Bose-Einstein condensate. These condensates uh, are especially interesting if you bring them into small structures or small feature sizes because then we have induced quantization effects in such Bose-Einstein condensates and that will be used in my presentation. And I will also show you a new way how to create a quantized magnonic Bose-Einstein condensate and that is a new method of rapid cooling. I will show you how we can use these condensates and create a magnonic qubits and how we can actually do uh, to, for how can we actually find recipes for magnonic qubit calculus? So the main idea of my presentation is to find a macroscopic magnonic quantum states. And uh, these quantum states provide the macroscopic wave functions, which we need to use. These wave functions can interfere. These wave functions are nonlinear because we are working in a magnonic system where the landau lifshitz equation, the fundamental equation for the description, is already nonlinear. Uh, and these macroscopic wave functions are analogous to that what you might know from superconductivity, where we have, for instance, Josephson currents and from superfluidity. Especially interesting is uh, that these uh, states can be made free of dissipation, but these are excitation states on the, of the condensates. The condensates themselves, of course, always decay into the phononic system with a finite lifetime. So, uh, just a small repetition here. You can understand the magnons in a quantum mechanical description as a quanta of a spin waves. So they have energy, which you'll find here. Uh, they have linear momentum. They can have mass, which is simply provided by the curvature of the dispersion, very analogous to that what you know of the mass of the electrons in a solid state system. And the magnon has a spin s equal to one. And I was already mentioning nonlinear interactions. They are described very conveniently by discussing four and three magnon scattering. You see here just a spin wave propagating from the lower left to the upper right corner. So these are the systems we are discussing here. Um, um, I now skip a lot of theory and I will just show you what the dispersion looks like. So if we plot the dispersion and that is the frequency as a function of the wave vector, then we have this characteristic features. You see here the dispersion of two different modes, this pink one and the blue one. The pink one with the propagation perpendicular to an applied field. The field is applied in a film plane. Um, and the blue one is propagation along the field direction. Oh, that is actually a mistake. You should say along the field direction. And very characteristic in this case, um, the modes have a minimum. These core modes are actually called the backward volume modes because if you look here into this regime, you see the slope is negative and the slope is the group velocity. 
What you also see in this diagram is many black lines. These are the so-called standing spin waves. Uh, these are modes which travel forth and back between the two sides of a film, the front side and the back side, and due to the finite thickness, which typically is a couple of micrometer or even much less, uh, they form uh, just a set of discrete modes. Essentially, if the, modes, if the mode spacing is very narrow, like you see it here, you can consider this as a continuum of modes, which we then can excite. Notice also that we plot these diagrams for positive and for negative wave vectors. The idea behind is if we plot it for both directions, we find two minima here in our, in our dispersion. If you propagate in other directions, then uh, this will, uh, these minima will, will just disappear. So we have the minimum frequencies and they are very important for us for the, for the Bose-Einstein condensate because they form exactly here at the minima. We can describe the population of the states with the Bose-Einstein distribution function, which you see here. D as a function of omega is just a density, and rho as a function of omega is uh, the density of the occupied states. And then we have the Bose-Einstein distribution factor, which you find here. What enters is the energy, the temperature, as well as the chemical potential. Chemical potential normally for an open system is zero, but if we somehow manage to close the system or to, to, to change the number of occupied states in the system, then the chemical potential can be finite. And you'll see here is evidence for a very important fingerprint for a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that is, if the frequency matches the chemical potential, then this difference here is zero. The exponential term becomes unity, and unity minus unity in the denominator again becomes zero. So the density of occupied states will diverge. And that is just a fingerprint of a Bose-Einstein condensate. So we saw already Magnons are bosons and uh, they can be described in the thermal equilibrium by this Bose-Einstein distribution function. And normally you describe them with zero chemical potential if, if it is an open system. Um, let's just show you what this looks like. You can plot this function here uh, on a log-log scale. So we plot the logarithm of the quasi-particle density, so rho as a function of omega, uh, as a function of the frequency. And uh, if the chemical potential is zero for a given temperature, let's say room temperature, we have this blue curve, this blue occupation number. We can now ask what happens if the chemical potential becomes equal to this minimum frequency, so if this difference becomes zero. Then we have this, this divergence, which I was already discussing in a few seconds ago. <coughs> so how can we create such a chemical potential. The method of choice, which we do since many, many years, is uh, parametric pumping. We can also call that a spatial injection of magnons because at a certain position in the sample, we just inject magnons. So we have much more magnons in the system than we would just thermally expect. And that we can simply do with a microwave source of frequency omega p, omega pumping, and each microwave photon decays into two magnons of opposite wave vectors and half the frequency for energy and momentum conservation here at this pink points. And then for magnon scattering sets in, uh, so all these intermediate states will be occupied somehow and the population will trickle down to the minimum frequency uh, where then a Bose-Einstein condensate is formed. This process is very well understood uh, and the term uh, uh, evaporative cooling for the Magnon system he, of the Magnon gas here in between has been coined and you see the references here. So uh, the key element here is that the excess Magnons which we prepare here in the system cannot relax within the system relaxation time and therefore they increase the chemical potential until the condition of the Bose-Einstein condensation is formed. So this was spatial injection, but we can also consider time scale injection in a confined system. For instance, by changing the temperature of the system very, very rapidly, and very rapidly simply means uh, on a time scale which is faster than the relaxation time. And let me show you that this works, and that is a work in particular by Michael Schneider, so his PhD project, and supervised by Andre Chumak, who is now in Vienna. 
So here's the idea. So again, a plot here is a quasi-particle density as a function of frequency in a log-log scale for a given temperature, let's say room temperature, zero chemical potential. And now let's simply assume that we increase the temperature uh, by a couple of degrees, let's say by 50 degrees. Then, of course, this curve will shift up because at a higher temperature, the density of occupied states will become larger because the temperature enters here as a Bose-Einstein factor. Now, let's assume we cool the system down instantly. That is a Gedanken experiment. If you would do so, then all these Mach nodes here in this hedged area, they are, of course, excess Mach nodes for the room temperature case. So they must move somewhere. They must disappear. And what are the mechanisms for that? Number one is we have the Gilbert damping, which works more effectively for the larger frequency. And then we have the four Magnus scattering events. We also have Cherenkov scattering from phonons, but I have no detail to go, uh, no time to go into more details of this mechanism. And essentially, they all shift the weights here, the spectral weights to smaller frequencies. This can be described with a rate equation model. And again, what one finds, uh, if one solves that, and I have to skip the details here, that the condition for Bose-Einstein condensation, and that is a chemical potential equals the minimum frequency is met. So this can be realized in an experiment. And the experiment is rather simple. We just have to use a small sample, small because of the heat capacity. You see it's four micrometer long, 500 micrometer wide, and only a couple of micrometers of nanometer thick, 70 nanometers. Uh, and it is covered with some platinum film that is only used for heating. And we use Brillo and light scattering to detect the population of the magnons uh, in the laser focus where we do inelastic scattering of light with Brillo and light scattering. And let me just show you already the result. Um, what you see here is simply a spectrum uh, in a false color representation. So here we see the fundamental mode, which will become the Bose-Einstein condensate. We see here the first perpendicular standing spin wave. So one of the many black lines, but here the separation is large because the film thickness is very, very small. We also see a peculiarity of a confined system that is an edge mode, which only exists at the edges of our sample, but we will not consider this mode any farther. So that is a Magnon thermal spectrum at 300 Kelvin, room temperature. And now what we can do, we can put a DC current through the platinum cover layer, so the system will heat up here in this case to 415 Kelvin. You see the frequencies go somewhat down. That is clear because at higher temperatures the saturation magnetization will be smaller, therefore the Lamo frequency will be reduced. This means everything is lower and you see it very nicely how it just moves, moves down here. And now what we can do is we can simply stop the heating and then just remember the sample. This was a sample mounted on a GGG substrate, gadolinium gallium garnet, and that has a very good thermal conductivity. So what will happen is that if we now stop it, the system will immediately cool down. And then we meet the condition here that the chemical potential becomes equal to the minimum frequency. And you'll see in the experimental data very nicely the fingerprint, which is just a red spot, which means large intensity. Uh, and then after some time, it decays into the phononic system, like we all know. So is it really the case? The nice thing here is that we also observe this first standing spin waves. And uh, if we take the population of the first perpendicular standing spin wave and of the fundamental mode, we can estimate the chemical potential just by using this very simple formula, which is derived from the bose einstein distribution function, or if you like, you can even use the Rayleigh genes distribution function, which approximates the bose einstein function very, very well. And if we do so, then we find something very interesting, because we now can calculate the chemical potential from the populations of these two modes. Here we see the population of the, of the, of the uh, fundamental mode, where the Bose-Einstein condensation happens. And indeed, where we observe the large increase in the density, the chemical potential matches the frequency. So to so my view, that is the best experimental uh, proof that indeed the chemical potential plays a very, very important role here. So we can make this kind of condensates.
So now let's look a little bit more about the properties of the Markman condensates in, in such confined systems. And what I would like to present you is now numerical simulations done by Morteza in collaboration with Philip Perrault and especially with Arne Bratasch, who also has started this kind of numerical simulations. But I must give credit to Morteza because he was the first who really could show that you can simulate the Bose-Einstein condensate on a computer. And he does it by solving the Landau Lifshitz equation using the mu max 3 mode uh, code. And let me already mention here that this result is very, very important because um, Landau Lifshitz is classical physics, it's not quantum mechanics. So, with classical methods, we can realize a Bose Einstein condensate. So what has he done? He has really simulated the experiment. So he takes a Yig stripe, here you see the dimensions, rather thin 85 nanometer thick in this case. Uh, he simulates a wire, an electric current carrying wire, which is fed with a microwave signal. Here you see the dimensions. And then he can simulate on the computer the, the parametric pumping process. And here you see the result. Again, you see the dispersion. The dashed white lines is uh, the, the dispersion curve, which you would expect. Um, frequency as a function of the wave vectors. And now when, you sw when he switches on on his computer, the microwaves for parametric pumping, he finds immediately that these states are populated. Again, a false color picture. So we see a pairs of magnons at half the pumping frequency. You see also some weak population here at the larger wave vectors, which you can, of course, discuss in a computer simulation model very conveniently. Now, if uh, Morteza waits a little bit in a simulation, um, then he sees that the four Magnon scattering mechanism sets in. So always two pairs of Magnons here scatter into two other states. These can be pairs of Magnons which you find here on the next dispersion curve or here on the, on the lowest dispersion curve. You also see that he finds four Magnon scattering processes where one of the outgoing Magnons is at lower frequency and the others here at higher frequencies. This all can be followed in every detail. I have, again, no time to go into the details, but you see how it all works. And if he now waits a little bit longer, then he sees uh, that all these states, which he finds here, condense via four Magnon scattering processes into a Bose-Einstein condensate. The Bose-Einstein condensation in the two global minima, which we have in our dispersion scheme, that can happen uh, on, on, a, on a computer using this mu max 3 simulation tool. So it proves again, I was mentioning it, it's a classic process. What happens here is a Bose-Einstein condensation is not a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Uh, many things can be done, for instance, ad additional investigations, which we have done. For instance, we can investigate the threshold properties for parametric generation, the threshold for four Magnon scattering and for the Magnon condensation. And he finds a decay time of the condensed Magnons of 100 nanoseconds by putting everything uh, properly into account. And uh, that is all very, very reasonable results. Okay. So we have now macroscopic wave functions in the experiment. We can prepare them with conventional parametric pumping. We can, can prepare them with the new methods of ultra-fast computing. We have quantized modes. We can simulate everything on a computer. So we are asking ourselves, what is the next step? So can we do qubit computing with these kinds of states? Um, so. What is a qubit? A qubit is a very, very general concept which we find in many fields in, in physics. All what we need is two states. We call it the plus states or the minus state, or sometimes we call it the north pole state and the south pole state, or state one and two, just two states which have well-defined amplitudes and phases. Um, so that's a superposed state plus and minus with prefactors A and B forms a qubit. So everything should be determined for the states. In a quantum mechanical system, of course, uh, you usually only look at the Z component, but you all know how this works. 
And the idea is now, since we have two condensates, we can use the two wave functions of the two condensates as a functions plus and minus uh, in order to form a qubit out of these two BECs. That is the key idea behind. And you all might be familiar that qubits can be represented um, by states on the surface of the Bloch sphere, that is a sphere of, 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 of unit radius. Um, if we only have the plus state, you find it, for instance, here at the North Pole. If you only have the minus state, we find it here at the South Pole. And any superposition, A times plus, plus B times minus, is a state here on the surface of the Bloch sphere. And you notice we can describe it with two angles, the polar angle of theta and the azimuthal angle phi. Uh, that is an, an equivalent description of each state on the surface of the Bloch sphere. And um, let me, I was already mentioning a couple of times the issue of classic versus quantum mechanical description. Um, uh, in the quantum mechanical world, of course, you have entanglement which is very, very important, for instance, for, for, for uh, uh, encryption uh, applications. Uh, there's actually even a classical analog, uh, an analog to that, and that is the non-separability of wave functions. If you have a classic system, which we describe as wave functions, two superimposed wave functions of two condensates or two photons, then uh, there is a phenomenon of non-separability. So if you cannot um, separate two states, then this is a classic analog to what you find as entanglement in quantum, the quantum mechanical world. I should mention the noise issue. In the quantum world, you have the quantum noise, a big problem because you have to have corrections for that. And in the classic world, of course, you have classic noise. Uh, a very, very important application is a fast Fourier transform. And, and very often, if you think about the Shor algorithm in quantum mechanic qubit calculus, um, then the fast Fourier transform is a central element of the Shor algorithm. But there are also proposals how very conveniently FFT can be done with classic wave functions, and that is still much, much, much faster than if you would do a conventional uh, calculus using Boolean logic. There are many more algorithms which are interesting. For instance, a search algorithm to find secret uh, n-bit strings hidden in a black box, um, which work free of entanglement, and they can be realized using quantum mechanic qubit calculus, but also classical qubit calculus. And there are distribution protocol things um, where also no quantum entanglement is required. So there is quite a large field where classical qubit calculus is much superior to Boolean logic. Also, it is not yet in the quantum world. And think about if you have a classical qubit system, you can run it at room temperature. So you don't need for that computer um, uh, this or this cooling facilities. If you would like to have a qubit computer in your armrest uh, watch, then uh, it is it certainly will be classical because you cannot build a fridge into your watch. So description is very straightforward. So you have two wave functions, which is which you see here. So we have a, a wave function of psi as a function of space and time, plus this exponential term, which has the explicit space and time dependencies with corresponding wave vectors q and omega for the b. It's a BEC point, and. Uh, uh, in addition to this plus wave function, we have the minus wave function, which is written here, just with a change here in the sign of, of the wave vector. Um, the fundamental description is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is also known as the gross pitayevsky equation for the expert, which you find here. It's a one-dimensional problem, which we have here. And the terms uh, which enter is the dispersion coefficient, um, is um, the self-interaction of two Mark nons and is a cross-interaction of two Mark nons between two condensates. And we also can have external potentials for confinement, for instance. We have damping to the phonon system, and we can have external forces, which we need, for instance, if you want to describe parametric pumping with this set of equations. So solving these classic equations gives us now a straightforward method to, 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 to see what the physics 
behind it. And here you see what Motesa has calculated, for instance, as a Mach non density, as a function of frequency for films with these parameters. Um, if he just pumps, he gets this distribution here of Mach non density uh, during the pumping. And if he now waits for the relaxation where the BC forms, you see very nicely of how this very, very sharp BC peak is formed. And again, you have seen that in the simulations. Here is uh, the, the BC in the files color picture, how it can be formed. Um, you have two wave functions. First question is if you have two wave functions, of course, you should see some interference. And indeed, in the computer, he finds interference. He finds even something more. I have no time to go into the details because this is all very, very new. You find even vortex formation, for instance, here. Yeah? So characteristic vortices are found. Uh, this has been found in the experiment by the Münster group some time ago. And uh, so that is reproduced here in these, in these calculations. So we now have to fulfill two tasks. One is the initialization of qubits and the second is to move qubit states across the surface of the block sphere. So let me just show you a few things which what, 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 what can be done. For instance, um, uh, wave vector selective parametric pumping, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is able to only prepare states at the North Pole or vice versa at the South Pole. And, uh, we can also seed the BEC wave function and to prepare any azimuthal phase value here for states on the equator. If we prepare this conventional parametric pumping, then we populate both condensates and then we have states which are somewhere here on the equator. Um, let me show you a nice, I wouldn't call it a trick, a nice method uh, which we have developed for that. And that is the use of magnonic crystals, which are known since quite some time. Here you see such a conventional magnonic crystal, some wires across the sample. We can put a DC current through the wires. Then we just have a periodic disturbance of the internal field via the Ørsted field. You see a very schematic picture. You see the periodicity A. And what happens is, that in this case, Bragg reflection of the Magnon sets in. And that means if each dashed line here is such a wire, so the Magnons can be scattered. So if the incoming Magnons are scattered from these wires, and if that happens in a phase coherent manner, then all the incoming spin waves are reflected. And the Bragg condition simply is uh, that an integer multiple of the wavelengths of the Magnons must be two times the periodicity of what you have here. Classical Bragg reflection. And uh, if you look into the dispersion, you see here the initial negative slope of a backward volume mode, then gaps open. And uh, what happens is if you have Magnons sitting here in the gaps, then they are just scattered back and forth between these two gaps. A phenomenon very well known in solid state physics, for instance, that is just a gap formation for semiconductors if you consider the wave functions of electrons. It has actually a very interesting aspect because if you have this kind of oscillations, then uh, we can understand this phenomenon as Rabi oscillations. Uh, this simply means uh, at a certain point in time, only the BEC plus is populated. And then if you wait a little bit, then the population is transferred to BEC minus. And if you wait a little bit longer, it transferred back here to BEC plus. So we have an oscillation of population in the simulation. It simply looks like you find here, you see very nicely here, the oscillations, of course, superimposed with a global decay, which we always have here. And you can understand this or name it Rabi oscillations. Rabi oscillations you usually have if you have two distinct states spaced in energy. Um, and then if you shine in with laser light of a frequency which corresponds to the difference in the energy, you get oscillations between the states. Here it is Rabi oscillations, not between two different energy states, but between dif two different wave vector states. So it's uh, wave vector Rabi oscillations. So that exists indeed. And that can be, trans so Rabi oscillations can be translated into the wave vector domain. And very important, this can be used to manipulate the Mark non qubit states on the block sphere, because if only the North Pole is populated, if we apply the Rabi 
oscillations, then we can transfer the population to the South Pole, for instance. I will show you that we can even do a little bit more sophisticated manipulation. Let's use the same sample, but now all these five wires are now fired with microwave signals, and these microwave signals have different phases. You see the first one has phase zero, the second should have phase pi over two, the second pi, and so on and so on. And what happens if we do that, we create just a spatial dynamic field and you see here in the simulation what happens. So you see that the dynamic field here, this uh, outside, uh, is just propagating from the right to the left. And that can be used now uh, to transform the wave vector of the photons now to a point which is defined by this dynamic magnonic crystal. And if this photon now decays into pairs of magnons, you see that these magnons are now only here in the green part of the spectrum. So we populate only what we call the North Pole state. And indeed, if, if Morteza does it on the computer, he finds that only the BC plus states are populated. Um, there are many ways how to move a magnon qubit on the Bloch sphere. So, for instance, wave vector selective conversion from BEC plus to BEC minus, manipulation of qubits by fast switching magnonic crystals, taking advantage of the Rabi um, oscillations. Um, and we can also manipulate the phase shift between these two, with these two states. And uh, just in very, very, very short, uh, this helps us to, to uh, realize unitary operators, for instance, the very famous Hadamard gate here on the computer. So the recipes are there. Now, of course, we need to, 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 to show that indeed this works. Um, there are many ways, and my time is actually getting to an end. Uh, just a very simple trick how this could also be realized if we have the two condensates. We again can work with a magnonic crystal, but we can drive it now at a very low frequency, 10 megahertz, so in the RF frequency range. If we do so, we shift the frequency of the blue magnons here slightly up, and then they can relax back into the green magnons. But if we look at the opposite ways, then we would shift down the frequency. Here are no states, so this mechanism is forbidden. So what we have here is a pumping mechanism to pump magnons from the blue states into the green states, but not vice versa. On the computer, you see that this realization works very nicely. So there are many ways, many recipes around what, what, what could be done. I am at my end. Outlook is, of course, that the next step would be to combine two magnons, the two, two qubits, and to discuss two qubit tasks. This can be done by tunneling across a depth gap, by tunneling across a control line where we interrupt the Bose Einstein condensate, or we can even realize something which is called in photonics a flying qubit, a phase coherent transfer of a BEC state from one condensate to another by electric means with some wires which transports the information phase coherently. This brings me to my end. So I showed you that magnon condensate uh, behavior in confined nano and microstructures can be investigated by polar and light scattering and micromagnetic modeling. We showed how to realize a magnonic qubit based on the two wave vector component magnon condensates. And I showed you some recipes for the initialization um, and for magnonic qubit protocols um, in order to facilitate um, qubit calculus. Thank you very much for your attention.